Welcome to Is Luella. Today we will be exploring our baseball history and we are blessed to have Mr. Mike Norris, a former Major League Baseball player. Welcome Mr. Norris. Thank you for having me, Luella. It's such a blessing to have you here. Mike, you are just doing so many phenomenal things in your life and I would like to start off by talking about the children's lives that you have touched with your baseball academy. Well, this is something that's very dear to my heart. Uh, after retiring from Major League Baseball, I had a very big void in my life. And then after watching the, the precipitous drop in uh, black athletes and playing in Major League Baseball, I thought that uh, me being a former black ace, which is uh, I'm one of 15 African-American ballplayers to have won 20 games in a season in Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. And as I saw the drop in baseball, I wondered would there ever be another 20 game black pitcher again? So I started my youth foundation, the Mike Norris School of Health and Wellness. And then the Oakland A's have stepped in and uh, given me the opportunity to be one of eight Urban League uh, Baseball Academies. And I now have a Major League Baseball Academy. Great, and can you tell us where that's located at? Uh, it's, uh, our hub is in Oakland, but we are, have nine teams in nine different cities. And those cities include uh, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, uh, San Pablo, Richmond, Antioch, Pittsburgh, Fairfield, and Vallejo. Beautiful. And then, um, so tell me like uh, some of the victories that you have experienced from having the academy already with the children. Well, I'm so proud that uh, our main focus, instead of being baseball the primary, we're having uh, academics as the primary, and so uh, an education is first and foremost in, in any kid's life, and so I'm very proud to have that component in my uh, uh, program. And how old were you when you started playing baseball? Uh, I, I'd say uh, my mom let me out of the house. Uh, we used to live in the projects, and so uh, you go down the play yard, there's an immense amount of kids playing, and they happen to have been playing a little, uh, little softball that day, and so uh, Back in the days when they chose teams, they would get the baseball bat and then they would give it and then we'd pick hands and then whoever got to the top of the bat, pick first. Well, everybody got picked and stuff, so then the last two people were left was me and this other girl. And so they picked me last and the girl went before me. I wound up getting two hits out there that day and I was able to catch the ball at seven years old, so I was able to compete with the older kids at seven years old. That is so amazing. And you know, my thing is I was wondering, um, how did it feel when you found out that you was so gifted and talented at being a pitcher? Well, that happened, uh, the baseball coach, when we all were trying out for the team, he wanted to see he needed a pitcher. So he lined each one of us up on the mound and he wanted to see who threw the hardest and who was the most accurate. And out of the 12 guys, that became me. Wow. And that's how my pitching prowess became. Now tell me, what was the speed of your ball? Well, before, they, now they have uh, radar guns, and before they had the radar gun, it was a jugs gun, they called it. And a radar gun would be equivalent to what the Highway Patrol would use. A jugs gun is about three to four miles slower than that. So I was clocked at uh, 92 miles an hour with the jugs gun, which wow. would have been equivalent to probably 95, 96 miles an hour. That is so awesome. And what was your first big game? Well, uh, I became, uh, in my Major League debut, my first uh, start in the Major Leagues, I became the 35th pitcher in Major League history to throw a complete game shutout. Wow. And I won three to nothing against the Chicago White, Hawks, Chicago White Sox as I three hit them that day. Now, what color was the glove that you wore on the field? Well, uh, I was called a hot dog, and a hot dog is a person that's pretty much a show-off. And everyone had brown gloves back in that era, and I was the first one to ever come out with a different color glove, which was green, which would match the color of our uniforms. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so today, uh, children all over are, are the most, in, most emphatic about the gold glove, I mean the green glove, opposed to my gold glove. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mike, you are just doing so many things, not only with the Baseball Academy, but I know that you're also um, doing something with the wellness program. Let's talk about that. Well, uh, health and wellness is a big issue, and uh, nutrition 
is a very big part of my health and wellness. Uh, mentoring, tutoring, and nutrition are the three factors or the components that make up my program. And I'm just real pleased that, uh, that I'm, and I'm able to have that because yes. it's, it's essential. I'd like to know, what is your views on gentrification? Gentrification is the new discrimination. Uh, gentrification is it's a sad thing uh, where you have middle class people that are moving into neighborhoods that are underprivileged and a lot of these people are, are a result from the Silicon Valley and they coming from San Francisco and they come over to the East Bay because the rent is cheaper, uh, it's closer to get back to San Francisco and so a lot of uh, neighborhoods, especially the black neighborhoods, are being taken over with the gentrification. And it's just a really a, a tough thing to watch. It really is, and I totally agree with you. Now, I know that um, we both know Dr. Ange Angela Wheeler, who has a foundation called the Ann Weaver Foundation for Sarcoidosis that me and Mike Norris has been very highly supported. But I would like for you to talk about your viewpoint on that particular disease, sarcoidosis. Well, I'm an advocate for sarcoidosis, for one. And uh, I became very interested in sarcoidosis because it, it affects mostly black women between the ages of 20 to 40. And this really rang true to me. And I wanted to become more aware of it. And once uh, Mrs. Wheeler and I are very good friends, and once she expressed to me how her mom passed away from it, I became even more interested in it. Right, that's what got me interested in it because I didn't really know much about the disease until she um, educated me on it about the sarcoidosis, right. and I uh, started meeting people with that disease. Right. And it's not a lot of a disease that we have enough information out not there. Not at all. And we've had some great people leave us uh, through death. Uh, the bereavement is incredible. People like Mahalia Jackson. Uh, Bernie Mac, Bernie Mac, uh, Reggie White, the great mm -hmm. Hall of Fame football player. Uh, so it's affected a lot of lives. People that are still currently living, uh, Trisha Campbell, uh, uh, Tisha Campbell, uh, used to be on Martin, right. co-star of Martin. Uh, Floyd Mayweather's father, the senior, has it. And so it's a lot of people that are afflicted with it but still living. So it's kind of a difficult thing. You don't know when you're going to die from it. There's no prognosis of it, right? but at the same time, it, it, it will sneak up on you and take your life from you. Right. Uh, Mike Norris uh, last year published an amazing, powerful book called Black Ball Twice, and he um, is going to be reading an excerpt about sarcoidosis in his Black Ball Twice book that was published by Sisters with Ink. Uh, quickly, I learned about sarcoidosis with much intrigue. Weight loss, fever, swollen lymph nodes resulting in exhausting fatigue. Almost everyone who has sarcoidosis eventually experiences lung problems, a persistent cough, shortness of breath, and wheezing. To say the least, this doesn't sound too pleasing. Yes, that, that says a lot. Yeah. And um, I really want to encourage um, our viewers to look into that disease, sarcoidosis, because it's not enough information about it. And if you're on Facebook, please look up Dr. Angela Wheeler, who has um, built a major foundation surrounding the sarcoidosis, and she's trying to get education and bring people together, and she's doing a lot of wonderful things surrounding that. So, And if you're um, interested, also email me, and I will make sure that you're connected to her. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, also... Um, was there a period that you was incarcerated? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I made two extreme mistakes in my young life. One was indulging in drugs, specifically cocaine, which, of course, had been illegal. And, of course, in baseball, it was ostracized. Uh, them not knowing what to do with that, since that was basically a new drug, um, I was basically the brunt of it. And I was, became backball from baseball for four years. So I wasn't able to play baseball in the major leagues for four years. Wow. And the only reason why they brought me back was an insurance policy for Lloyds of London that they had for maybe over $10 million. Wow. And so uh, I had to uh, uh, take a uh, uh, deposition. And one was for the Oakland A's. I took it for the A's. And they said that the reason why I was in ba wasn't in baseball anymore, it was because of my arm, which did go out. And then 
uh, Lloyds of London was saying the reason why I was out of baseball was because of drugs and alcohol. So obviously the Oakland A's won that case, and so they got me on the team, paid me the minimum league minimum of $100,000, and so they released me within three months after they won the deposition. Wow, that's And so terrible. it was a great business deal for them to get $10 million and give me 100000 so that was a $900,000 profit they got, which they suspended me and didn't pay me, and that was my year's salary was $900,000 a year. Oh, wow. So I took that tremendously hard, and so this is why I was able to write about it in the book. Right. So let's talk about your, your, your book, because I know that that's your first book, but you have another book coming out. But let's talk about Black Ball Twice. Like, what is the purpose that you hope for your readers to get out of that book? Well, well first of all, I'd like to thank you, because no one would touch this book because it's so controversial. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm in debt to you the rest of my life for that. I really appreciate you and love you for that. Thank but you. Uh, the book tells about the commissioner of baseball who was behind the machination and the conspiracy of getting blacks out of baseball. And so um, I think over and all it was about 35 blacks that got indi indicted, four went to prison, and uh, only three white people were involved in it. And two of those weren't even starters. And then you have a lot of Hall of Famers that are in the Hall of Fame right now that are white individuals. Mm -hmm. And, and some of the blacks aren't in it. So it's very unfair and unjust. I agree with you, Mike. Let's talk about the statistics around baseball, about how the African-American numbers are falling off in the baseball. Um, what do you think is the cause of that? Well, it's a precipitous drop, and it comes from, like I was talking about, the cocaine era that we had in baseball. Mm. And so, like I said, they made the blacks the example, and it just turned out that they thought, why are we going to pay a bunch of uneducated people all this money and they're going to blow it on drugs? So they stopped drafting and coming into the neighborhoods like they used to draft us. They would come out to the ballparks and they stopped doing that. Wow. Stopped coming into the ghettos to get the black kids to play baseball. And that's what happened. And then um, life in itself is, is a secondary phase of there's no black fathers in the home. You learn how to play baseball by your dad or your uncle or somebody taking you out in the backyard and playing catch. Right. And there was no one to do that for these kids. Secondly, it's the game is outpriced the black kids. Uh, it's too expensive to play the game. An aluminum bat costs you $300. And there's no black mom that's, gonna, that's on welfare or on a low income going to be able to afford the aluminum bat, $300, the baseball glove, $100, the pair of shoes, $100. It's ridiculous. Right. And now everything is in the age of the travel ball now. So it costs $1,000 for your kid to play on a travel ball team, wow. which is why I instituted what I have. My kids play for free. We give them equipment, gloves, and uniforms to okay. play. Okay. And let's talk about your, your uh, program because if someone was interested in registering their kid in your academy, how would they connect with you? We're having an orientation and a sign-up on June the 9th at uh, – Defermary Park in Oakland, and uh, it's going to be a clinic that we're going to hold to teach kids how to hit, run, and throw, and it'll be from ages 4 to 17, and uh, we have uh, nine ex-major league ball players out there to help them uh, learn how to play baseball. That is so beautiful, um, because I know that that's what our um, community lack is enough people coming forth and mentoring our children and teaching them and opening their minds up, you know, because a lot of our kids is getting so tied up in social media. And, you know, a mind is a terrible thing to waste and we want to keep them very active. It truly is. Um, so I really want to just thank you, Mike, for um, all of your, what you contribute to the community, the programs that you're doing to uh, just expound our kids and make them go reach higher and further. And what would you like for our viewers to take away from knowing how to pursue their dreams? Well, dreams are, are an incredible thing, and they do come true. Uh, I'll tell you a quick dream that I used to have as a kid when I wasn't asleep. I'd dream about, and I'd fall asleep, and I'd dream and wake up that I'd be in the San Francisco Giants dugout, and Willie Mays and Jim Ray Hart and Lance Cepeda and Juan Marichal and Willie McCovey would sit down and have a conversation with me. 20 years later, I'm playing in the major leagues with Willie McCovey. Wow. It's a dream come true. It's just totally amazing. That's great. Good. So, you know, if they always tell me that your job is not a job if you enjoy your work. 
Right. And so if you can find totally something agree. that you like doing, stick with it. I totally agree with you, and I think those are some great positive words. Welcome back. I just had to add in a little bit more information about Mike Norris. It also um, has a STEM Foundation education. Could you tell us more and how to uh, find out further information about that, Mike? Okay, well, I'm on the executive board of the STEM Foundation, and the STEM Foundation, if you want to get in touch with them, it's the uh, STEM Future Foundation. Uh, dot, dot org. Beautiful. Um, and, uh, you know, with our school system being antiquated as it is, the STEM Foundation, the STEM, STEM which stands, the increment is S-T-E-M, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And this is the education of the future. And uh, this has been in, in the neighborhood, in the school districts of Walnut Creek, Dublin, Pleasanton, and it's just now getting to Oakland. And so we're a little bit behind, but this is going to be the, the education of the future. And if you don't have an education that consists of STEM by, 20, uh, by 2020, then it's gonna, you're going to be in bad shape without a college education or without a STEM education. Wow. Well, thank you for uh, giving us heads up on that. We would definitely want our viewers to follow through with that.